Well, regardless of where you're at right now, uh, these are definitely days of uncertainty. Uh, we don't know what will happen with the future of COVID-19. Uh, we don't know how these closures will impact our economy. Uh, for some of us, like we don't, we don't even know if we will have steady income for the foreseeable future. So how how do we process these days? Like we have bills to pay. Uh, we have groceries to buy, we have lives to live, we have plans and visions for the future. How do we process moments of uncertainty? And the very encouraging answer to that question can be found in John 18. So I'm not stopping the John series. I believe the Bible addresses all the issues that that we face. So we don't need to hunt around the Bible um, looking for verses like some encyclopedia. As we walk through the Word, we will find everything we need. Um, so I did not plan to teach John 18 because of the situation we're in now. However, it does fit perfectly for uh, days like these. Um, so last week, we witnessed uh, the unique and special prayer uh, between Jesus and his father. Um, and in John 17, 9, that prayer it changes its focus from or to the disciples and for us as believers in Christ. Jesus's prayer for us is that he keeps us in his name. He offers us his fulfilling joy. He grows us in his word. He unifies us as his people, and he gives us an example of his love. Jesus is praying that his disciples would continue his mission as he is in them. And all throughout the Gospel of John, we read Jesus saying, The hour has not yet come. But in John 17, we find out that the time is now. Like What has been building throughout the Gospel of John is now becoming a full reality. The hour has come for Jesus. What will happen next? What will the future hold? What will the outcome in this hour of uncertainty? So we're going to be in John 18. Um, if you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you downloaded the notes uh, from the church email, you can see all the main scripture <laughs> in those uh, notes you can track along and I think there's a, um, a file in there as well with all the slides so you can track along that way as well but before we read John 18 1 through 11 I'm going to pray uh, for us father this is um, honestly it's just a humbling experience uh, this is strange on many levels but God what might throw us out of our normal routine um, can also cause us to see things more clearly, to become more focused on things that matter for eternity. Uh, so God, as we open uh, John 18 together, help us um, just to have a distraction-free uh, mind, that the power of the authority of your scripture stands in all ways, in all platforms, and so, God, uh, I just pray that you would speak to us through John 18. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and read John 18, 1 through 11. This is the whole narrative, and then we'll talk about it together. <clears throat> Verse 1 says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples ac across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to, said to them, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. 
And Jesus said, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing uh, with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have not lost one. And then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant's ear and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? We're going to look at uh, three truths of uncertainty or in uncertainty. Three truths in uncertainty. And to be clear, we constantly live in uncertainty. Like we just have a heightened sense of that right now. We love to pretend uh, to know what our earthly future holds. We love to think that we are safe by the dollars that are in our savings account. We love to think that we'll never get sick because of the healthy lifestyle we live. But all of that is really just an attempt to control what we cannot control. So we constantly live in uncertainty and pretend like we don't. If anything, this whole coronavirus stuff has thrown our minds to the reality that we aren't in control of everything in our life. So I want to be clear that we are living in times of uncertainty just like we always have. And if you're thinking like, wow, this this is a really depressing message. The news and social media are bad enough. Just stay with me because uh, although we don't always know what our earthly future holds, we do know someone that does. And so let me give you three truths in times uh, of uncertainty, three truths and uncertainty from John 18, 1 through 11. Here's the first one, looking at verses 1 through 4. The first one is this, is that Jesus knows the future. Jesus knows the future. <clears throat> when Jesus was finished praying to his father, we find him heading out across the Kidron Valley. And this valley it's, is east of the old city of Jerusalem, separates the city from the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus is headed, a place he often gathered together with his disciples. But now Judas enters the scene again. Uh, the, the disciple that betrayed Jesus, the last time Judas will be mentioned in John's gospel account. He has gathered together a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. Now, a few things to note on, on that before we continue. First, Judas probably didn't lead that crew. Judas wasn't some evil warrior coming with his army against Jesus. So I don't believe he had an influence like that. However, he has gotten word out about Jesus and he knew where they would gather in the Mount of Olives. Secondly, uh, honestly, that, like that's a pretty imp- impressive group coming after Jesus. The band of Roman soldiers could be anywhere from about 200 to 600 men. Okay, the officers from the chief priests were also arresting police or temple guards. Okay, so do we see just how insane that is? Jesus has not once done anything violent. Okay, Jesus has been walking around healing and teaching people. He was not acting like a violent terrorist in the Middle East. And yet, we see this level of response from the Roman authorities and the Jewish leadership. So what did they expect was going to happen when they got there? Uh, Did did they think that Jesus was going to do something supernatural? Uh, Did they think Jesus had some secret army like hiding in the hills? These men came after Jesus, as we read, with lanterns, torches, and weapons. They They were ready for a fight. I can only imagine... Uh, their hearts racing as they walk up to the Mount of Olives. And I can only imagine the anxiety these disciples felt as they watched this large group arrive. And here's what we find Jesus doing in verse 
4 if you look at the text. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? I, I love the resolve of Jesus in this intense moment. He already knows what the future holds. He knows what's about to go down. He knows who these men are after. He knows the pain of the cross that is before him. He knows that he will walk out of the grave in three days. Je like Jesus already knows. So don't miss the simplicity of what is happening in John 18, 4. Jesus knows all of what is going to go down with you and me. Like he isn't watching the news, waiting on the latest report. Jesus is not scrolling through his Facebook account, wondering what the rest of the world is up to. Jesus already knows the future. But that's uh, honestly like that's only half the good news, because if you look at Romans 8, 28, I'll read it. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Because we know that Jesus knows everyone who loves God, all things are for their good for those who are called according to his purpose. Not everything um, that is happening in the world is for everyone's good, just to be clear about that. Um, if you don't love God, bad things are just bad things. If you do love God, we can trust that bad things are being used for good and for his purpose. And honestly, that may not always feel that way as a child of God. Like it doesn't always feel good to get sick. It doesn't always feel good to get laid off work. It doesn't always feel good to worry about your income. But we believe in Jesus who knows the future and is working all things for good for his own purpose. That's the calm and the resolve that we see from the Son of God. All the disciples see are lanterns, torches, and weapons. All the disciples see are soldiers and temple police. But Jesus sees the future. Jesus knows how it's all going to go down. Jesus knows that everything is working according to his plan for those that love him. You can have that kind of calm resolve today. Trust and G that Jesus knows the future. Jesus knows the future is the first thing we see in the text. But secondly, verses five through nine, here's point number two, is that Jesus has authority over all things. Jesus has authority over all things. <clears throat> the question that, that Jesus asked is not, honestly, it's not one of ignorance but of an opportunity for this crowd to show their cards. Uh, so Jesus, he asked them at the end of verse four, who do you seek? And the response in verse five is, well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. The response is Je Jesus's earthly identity. He's the guy from Nazareth. That's, that's who we're coming after. But listen closely to what Jesus says in his response. He says, I am he. I am he. In the Greek, it's just simply I am. The crowd has identified Jesus as the guy from Nazareth, but Jesus identifies himself as God. Remember what we read? Uh, this was, this has been several weeks ago in Exodus 3. This is Exodus 3, 13 through 14. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of our fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, well, what, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. See, Jesus is not only some guy. He is the great I am. 
It's not simply a response to the crowd, but a statement. And how does the crowd respond? Well, if we look in verse 6, it says that they drew back and then they fell to the ground. What a wild, like what a wild scene that is. These are men trained to fight. Okay, these are men with adrenaline pumping and they're all taken down by two words of Jesus. I am. Do not be mistaken who's in control of the situation. Soldiers, officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees brought low by two words from the Son of God. Jesus is in control of every situa situation. They did not arrest and kill Jesus against his will. Jesus willingly offered his life. Now, if I'm a disciple in the garden, my thoughts are, well, this is game over. Okay, no hope here. We're, like, we are outnumbered by the enemy. And then Jesus flattens the crowd with I am. Don't forget that Jesus has authority over all things. When you or I are um, overwhelmed with the what ifs, know that Jesus has authority over everything. God is in control of this. Life can feel, uh, at least on this side of eternity, chaotic, but I promise you it's not. This is what Colossians 1 says, um, starting in verse 15, a little bit longer, but I'll read it. <clears throat> it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of, cro of the cross. Whatever you're facing right now, Jesus has authority over it. Jesus has authority over your bank account. Jesus has authority over the coronavirus. We might be working on a vaccine, but he could end it right now. So let's let's be honest about that. Um, why doesn't he? Uh, why does God continue to let these things happen? If God could stop someone you love from dying from cancer, why why doesn't he? If God has authority over your bank account, why would, why would he let you lose your job? If he has authority over your work and everything that's going on in this world. If God could stop the mess, why doesn't he? Well, simply Jesus is on a different mission than most of us. I truly believe that. It's not just me saying that. Well see it here in the text point three looking at verses 10 through 11 point three is this jesus is on a kingdom mission jesus is on a kingdom mission <clears throat> i'll read verses 10 through 11 again peter enters the scene then simon peter having a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? I truly don't know what Peter was thinking in that moment. Maybe it was fear. Uh, maybe it was boldness and courage. Um, maybe, maybe he wasn't thinking at all. But this guy pulls a sword 
out against these soldiers. Peter, a, a fisherman, not a skilled fighter, a fisherman, which is probably why he attacked the person that wasn't a soldier. Okay, at least he was smart enough to do that. We find out that Peter, he swings down and slices off the right ear of Malchus, who was a servant of the high priest. In Luke's gospel, we find that Jesus actually healed the man's ear after this incident. Um, Jesus says to Peter, put, put, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus is on a kingdom mission. Certainly, he is able to heal. We see that in the healing of, of the ear, but that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to sacrifice himself on our behalf so that we might be with him. Jesus came to die on the cross and then rise from the grave. 1 Peter 2, 22. Talking about Jesus, it says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like a sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. We want so desperately for Jesus to fix the now. Um, and that's a normal thing to want. Um, no one wants to suffer. No one wants to live a terrible life. No one wants to be sick. Um, but Jesus did not come to make our lives better. Jesus came to give us eternal life. That is the heart of kingdom mission. Peter failed to see it in the moment the same way that we all fail to see it so many times. Our mission in life is often just to keep everything fine. Like we, we want to gather on Sundays at 1207 Broad Street and just have a normal American church service. We want our jobs to pay well and, and to be secure. We want to go out to eat and to live normal lives. We want to, I, I want to watch my kids grow up without being wounded by the dark things of this world. We want to live a long and full life without being too sick. But seriously, the mission of the kingdom is greater than a picture perfect life. If the intensity of our faith is measured by being in a certain location, we are not being kingdom minded. The mission of the kingdom is bigger than an address. So let's put our swords away. Okay, now is not the time to attack each other. Now is not the time to fight over opinions. Now is not the time to fight for Jesus like he even needs our bidding. The hour has come not to take a religious stand the hour has come to look to Jesus and focus on his kingdom mission. So East River Park will point people to the mission of Jesus through his word. Always. That's what we're about. Okay. We'll do it when we gather together in a building. We'll do it together when we gather in homes. We'll do it together when we gather online and in digital spaces. We will do it even if we have to go into hiding that's what we're about. This isn't an issue of faith over fear. Church history is littered with faithful believers gathering in homes over fear for their life. Even Jesus avoided dangerous situations in his ministry, and he has more faith than you and I. This isn't an issue of faith over fear. This is an issue 
of focusing on the mission of Jesus that takes place everywhere the people of God are. So let's agree. Let's agree um, to put our sword away and watch Jesus do what he came to do. This is Revelation uh, 21. It says, then I saw a, this is Revelation 21 verse 1. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus is in the process of making all things new through his death and resurrection in one day not right now but one day uh, he will finish setting up his kingdom it will be a place of no more hysteria uh, no more tears no more sadness no more death no more struggle no more worrying about your job no more viruses no more anxiety no more depression or loneliness So let's be a people of hope. It's true. Times are uncertain. But honestly, they always have been. We only know a few things for sure. Christ conquered the grave. And we have eternal victory as his children. Jesus knows the future. Jesus has authority over all things. Jesus is on a kingdom mission. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you so much for your word um, that honestly encourages me in this um, honestly wild few weeks, Father, of just making decisions and doubting those decisions and um, trying to care for, for, for people. Father, give us wisdom as a church. God, give us Um, your word and your truth as a church of all the things that change and all the things, um, the things that we might have taken for granted in the past and we're unsure of now. God, the thing that never changes is you and your word. So God, help us to stand by your truth. Help us to be a church that loves each other well, um, that speaks to each other well, that loves our community well. Give us wisdom on how to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we're done, um, let me chat with our East River Park family, which I'm assuming is most of us. Um, We love you all very much, and we pray uh, often for you. The elders have and continue to to do our best to navigate these messy waters. And um, so please uh, pray for us in this season. Uh, We've reached out to many of our church widows and those that are in need. However, if you ever need anything or if you hear someone within our church body um, that has a need, please contact the church office. The phone number, um, if you don't know that, is 423-542-8783. Pretty sure I got that right. Um, And the email is office at eastriverpark.church and just reach out to us um, and we would love to um, be a service to our church family. Someone in our church sent me an encouraging text this week um, and a portion of that text said this. It says, I know we will be stronger through this and come together with a renewed purpose and a hunger to serve. Um, and I could not agree more. 
Uh, Jesus will get his glory through all of this. So thankful for you all.